Our next uh, session is um, What Can TV Learn from Film and Theatre? And we're very pleased to have with us Jan Harlan, who uh, lectures at film schools across the world. And Jan has worked on numerous films, including some you've never heard of, like The Shining and Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shut with Stanley Kubrick and um, AI with Steven Spielberg, and that's just a few of them. And then uh, we also have Nick Moran from the Association of Lighting Designers, and Nick works, uh, which is theatre lighting. And Nick works at the Central School of Speech and Drama, where he's responsible for both the lighting design and production lighting strands of the undergraduate degree course and doing some teaching at MA level as well. So um, we're going to be looking at the, also the, the importance, not just of craft, but of art. And um, Jan, you believe strongly that um, art is important feature of films. Uh, very much so. I mean, you know, it's kind of obvious, but how do you teach of, it? Kind of, kind of obvious, <laughs> there, yeah, and, and I um, gave it a lot of thought of how to teach it, and I'm doing it a lot in all over the world, as you say. Now, uh, first thing I want to do is I want to correct my credit. I'm listed here as film producer. Now, okay, it is true that I made five films I directed and produced in the last 15 years, but that's over two for Warner Brothers and the other for students. What I'm doing now is really, I'm a guest lecturer all over the place, and I'm accompanying a big exhibition about Stanley Kubrick, which goes around the world. It's right now in Toronto, then Mexico, then Seoul, then San Francisco, and so on. Maybe one day it comes to England as well. Um, I would like to, to also emphasize that the reason why I have been invited here is not because of have been doing the last 15 years, but because what I did 30 years earlier. For 30 years, I worked with Stanley Kubrick. I worked here in this place on Eyes Wide Shut. That was his last film. And um, talking about the art in film, I want to first start with a little anecdote. You may have heard about this old, oh, 80 years ago, Fritz Lang, a German film director. Um, he was famous at the time. He was asked by a student, um, what are the three most important things <coughs> to make a great film? And Mr. Lang answered, oh, you only need three things. Yes. Well, you need a great script. Then you really need a great script. And finally, you really must have a great <laughs> script. So now this is a real cop out. And, and of course, I told this to Stanley Kubrick, and he said, oh, yeah, I know the story, it's an old hat. I would put it differently. He said, yeah, what, what would you say if you were asked? Ah, you need really a great beginning, a fantastic ending, and something good in between. <laughs> well, I said, that, that's another cop out. Yeah? <laughs> so, I mean, the, the real answer, of course, is that you need to create something that's worth filming. That's a, that's a tall order. Now, I feel ancient when I walk through this exhibition here, all this equipment. Oh, goodness me, fantastic. Things have changed so much. And all this high definition, this, whatever, numbers and blah, fantastic. I, I'm reminded of one of my grandchildren asking me a while ago, when you were young, did they have already motor cars? <laughs> yeah, 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 they did. Yes, they did. So, but you know, this is all very relative. Yeah. So, um, what can I tell you? Uh, Stanley Kubrick was a man, and I'm, I'm now talking about Stanley Kubrick because that's really what I know about and what I have learned from him. I'm passing on to students. He was a very self-critical person, a struggling artist. Uh, very, very difficult to, to be satisfied with himself. I found very easy to work with him. He took time, and uh, the fact that he was demanding, I think is great, he should be. He respected the audience. The fact that his films always split the audience doesn't really matter, uh, that's okay. Uh, just think of uh, Picasso or Ingmar Bergman, Richard Wagner, they, they all split the audience, yeah? It, it, that's really highly irrelevant. Important as a filmmaker is that you get enough, a bigger enough share of the audience so that you can carry on. And um, then there, there's something else which I, I, I learned from also uh, film executives that, uh, and I observed this myself, that most films are done very efficiently, come in on schedule, on budget, mm. 
and they disappear as fast as they have been made without leaving a trace. Now, that's a destiny that Stanley Kubrick's films did not share. You know, he, his films were mostly profitable and none of them disappeared. <laughs> I mean, just think, go back to Lolita, Path of Glory, 2001. It's all there, you know? Uh, and uh, this is great. And I think this is the mark of an artist. It's not the technical stuff, as important as that is. Incredibly important. You need a good makeup person. You need a good focus puller. You need a good dolly pusher. Everybody has to be good, because if they are not, you are sunk. But they don't make the film. In the end, and I think you might agree with me, a filmmaker is in the, I'll call it the director, whatever, it doesn't really matter, is the combination of a great writer, of all the other great artists, the actors, of course, the designers, the camera, the lighting, and everything, into the person of the filmmaker. That person has the responsibility. That's my experience. And yeah, Stanley Kubrick once was asked, um, well, what is the most difficult thing of making a film? Uh, he had different versions, but at one point he, he said, uh, it, it's actually recorded on, 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 for television, it was a speech he gave at the Director's Guild in, in America. Um, he didn't travel, of course, he sent it by, by, by post. And, um, <laughs> And, and he, he said, well, Steven Spielberg, I think, summed it up beautifully when he was asked, what is the most difficult thing of making a film? It's getting out of the car. <laughs> I think it sums it up perfectly. Because you know exactly what he means. You know, it's down to the person alone in the very end. They're all there, all very brilliant people around, all the actors. There is Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, and what have you. So... What next? <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really down uh, to him. Yeah. So. Right. Okay. And well, that's just for, for openers. I mean, right. I can tell yes. you a lot about. Yes, I'm sure <laughs> there'll be more. Um, so, uh, Nick, uh, uh, that's follow that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, no easy task there. Um, I think the perhaps, and I, I hadn't thought about this before, so maybe going completely down the wrong aisle, but, but maybe one of the differences between theatre and film is that that's not true to anything like the same extent for theatre. Because once you've had the opening night, the director isn't there anymore, and you're left with the actors and all the supporting staff to continue that performance, perhaps grow that performance, perhaps make it even more of a thing each night for, for each new audience. Um, yeah, as I say, I haven't really thought about that, so I'm not going to go any further with that. Uh, the, I think part of the reason that I'm here is uh, to do with maybe articulating the symbiotic relationship between screen technologies and, and theatre. Uh, and how that works with uh, technicians, but more particularly for me, artists. Uh, and I think that the, the sort of in contrast to what Jan is saying, the, the theatre creative team um, gets broader with every new generation in a way. Uh, for lighting, which is my background, We've moved in a couple of generations from a situation where, uh, with relatively limited resources, a man often, always, sorry, in a brown coat often, uh, did what he was told by the director, him usually, uh, in a tweed suit, very often. Um, and now we're at a point where a, a whole team that may include director, set designer, costume designer, projection designer, sound designer, lighting designer, and others s work on a, on, on a concept, take it into a rehearsal room. I'm thinking about things like uh, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night, which is a, a, a really good example of collaboration, but there's other things. Tom Morris is a very good director working in this way. And what I'm certainly training my lighting designers fundamentally in is, is their artistic response to that. Now, okay, the analogy I've used with them before is 
if you're going to make, if you're going to be a great sculptor, you need to know how to put an armature together. Uh, and if you don't know how to put an armature together, your sculpture's not going to work. However, the most important thing is not the armature. It's, it's the sculpture overall. And, and if you haven't got a great idea for sculpture, there's no point in making the armature. So I hope that analogy kind of works. But that, that's where my, that's my starting point. And you mm -hmm. feel that the, um, uh, the way that uh, the, the training is done in theatre is actually more co collaborative than what we've been hearing about between TV production and um, colleges and universities. Well, I have some experience in, in television. My back to card actually says DOP on it. Um, but yes, and I'm, I'm, I don't have an enormous amount of, of experience in the training for television because my era when I was working in television, everybody was trained by the BBC. Um, I thought I'd say that quickly so we got over the hump. Uh, but yes, I mean, we make shows uh, and that's, that's a basic part of the training. So uh, in the three year progress through a degree, at any of the major drama schools doing any of the technical craft or design subjects, you will be making shows and working from a relatively junior role up through to a head of department, taking responsibility for um, you know, technical stuff like budget and, and, uh, and finish and getting the thing there on time and all those kinds of things, but also having creative input into how the story is told, sorry, how the story is told uh, and the look of the thing and the art of the thing. Yeah. So it's a more practical approach. I, I mean, think obviously you do a lot of theory as well, in well, terms of theatre yeah, stuff. So, yes, <laughs> but I think, yeah, I, th I think from what we've heard this morning, yes, we do a lot more theory. Um, uh, well, no, sorry, we do a lot more practice. Uh, they, they kind of learn not to plug too many lights into a four-way block by taking <laughs> it into rehearsals and getting it wrong. <laughs> I think it was very interesting what I heard this morning because I don't know much about it. I, I know you have to be on time, that I understand. But, but there, there, there are lots of other things which I found fascinating. And, uh, but all these things are in the service of the filmmaker. Yes. And uh, basically, I mean, what do we learn from the theatre? Goodness me, everything. We learn everything from Shakespeare. The whole world has learned from Shakespeare. You know, how to st structure a script. How to say in the beginning, hey, this is what it's going to be about. <laughs> Don't be surprised, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, enormously, so it's all in the writing. And very often people say about something, oh, well, it's only entertainment. I beg your pardon, it has to be entertainment. Mm -hmm. you, the most serious film has to be entertaining. Shakespeare was an entertainer, so was Mozart, so was Verdi. They, they were all great entertainers. And um, I must mention that uh, today, uh, Schindler's List will be screened in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, many people have criticized this film. I think it shouldn't be. The most fantastic part of Schindler's List is that it is also entertaining. And that's why so many people have seen it. Mm -hmm. And there is a wonderful line by Billy Wilder, who said, well, there are the 10 commandments of filmmaking. One to nine, don't bore people. <laughs> <laughs> and number 10, have total control. <laughs> uh, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, when you um, are working on, uh, when we're working on films, um, did you find that you always had enough skilled people? Was the competition for the job so great that there were always enough people who could do the job? No. You know, no, 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 we had a, a, a good crew. I was a member of the crew. I mean, my title was executive producer, it doesn't mean anything. But, uh, yeah, I was a member of the crew and I negotiated and I made deals and, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, Kubrick took a lot of time. Uh, I learned from him how to, what's really important and that's the moment, the moment you film. That's when you don't want to rush. And uh, he did many takes, and the actors loved it. I'm not saying it was a walk in the park always, but they really loved it, and they knew, of course, that they had a chance of being in a film 
that may also become an icon. They knew there was already Clockwork Orange and Lolita and Pass of Glory and 2001 in the background. So they knew that. So they were ready for everything that the director wanted. Uh, and in order to be able to take so much time, you have to have a small team. We were here at Pinewood Studios. We had four offices, uh, a Xerox machine. Um, OK, Tom and Nicole have their caravans, but that's just, yeah. So, uh, and, and very, very humble affair. Now, uh, I bought all the masks for The Shining that we needed in, in Venice. Is this a typical job for the executive producer? Yes, if you work for Stanley Kubrick. Because uh, oh, you can make a telephone call. So that's how it was. I loved it. It was brilliant. We were very, very few people. And uh, we took a long time. Uh, but we spent in a week as much money as comparable productions in a day. So what did, um, obviously we know Kubrick is often described as a genius, um, but what, how did he learn to translate what he had and his vis vision? How did he learn to translate that? I guess the shortcut and glib answer is slowly. Um, Yes, he was often called a genius, and his typical comment was, if they just knew how much work it was. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't mean all that much. But uh, he respected the audience, and he wanted to make sure that if people go and buy a ticket and get a babysitter and what have you, it's worth their while. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm perfectly, I mean, I'm so happy that he considered the last film he made here, Eyes Wide Shut, his greatest contribution to the art of filmmaking. The fact that it split the audience, and I mean, it was... Well, I still it don't matter. understand it, and well, I've seen it twice. Well, you should see it a third time. <laughs> right, uh, OK. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a wonderful film. It's very much based on Schnitzler. He didn't really change the story. Uh, he changed it in, in, in setting it in New York and putting it more on time, but that's, uh, that's really a form change, not a substantial one. Um, it's complicated. I mean, uh, Sigmund Freud called Schnitzler his alter ego. Uh, that, that's all that is in that film. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is complicated. Um, I think it is also entertaining. Uh, and what's so interesting for me is to see the difference how this film works in different cultures. It was hugely successful in the Mediterranean belt and in Japan. Not at all in America and here. Why so, is that? Ha, that's what I didn't know. So, I mean, I asked a journalist in Rome. We had lunch together. He wanted to know all kinds of things, and I told him that. And he said, oh, it seems fairly obvious. Said, what do you mean? Oh, it has to do with Catholicism. I said, I beg your pardon. Why? Ha, ha, because we are dealing with the topic of lust and sin. Well, you are making jokes about it. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not competent in saying whether he was right or not. But an interesting um, fax came from the Warner Brothers office in Tokyo after Eyes Wide Shut exploded. It was hugely successful. And uh, the information from the manager was, couples are leaving the cinema holding hands. <laughs> so... Well, I'm, masks. I'm, yeah. Masks are a Japanese thing, Pardon? of course. Masks, <laughs> big in Japan, aren't they? Yeah, well, so, there we are. You know, yeah. possibly that as well. No, yeah, there's so much for entertainment and theatre. I mean, to come back to the topic, mm. I think this is all, all goes together. And can you teach people to shoot artistically? Do you see I mean? so, and, and to, you know, to, or to, to, have a, a, to light a set artistically, not just to light it mechanically. What do you think, Nick? I think you can help them discover their way of doing it. I think the moment you say, this is how you do art, you're lost. Mm. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can teach somebody how to use a paintbrush, how to use oil paint, but you don't teach them what to put on the canvas and the order in which to put things on Well, you can teach them techniques, and then they can decide techniques. how Absolutely. much they make them their own. Absolutely. Yes. And I, I think if there is something that I, uh, you know, that I did hear as a common thing, the idea of students coming out on graduation thinking, I'm it now. And uh, it is one of those things that I say, I, I do a lot of the um, open day speeches for um, pr prospective candidates coming into the school. 
and I make it very clear that, that uh, to be a theatre artist is a progression on graduation. You are just starting. That mm. is not the end point at all. And that, that what a good drama school course will do for you is give you a trajectory that if you continue to pursue it, could enable you to be a, an influential manager, a great technician, uh, a fantastic designer, or whatever it is that you want to be, or a fantastic shop fitter, or no, what, yeah. no, you can take it in, in whatever way you want to take it. And do most of your students get employment? Because we know not all yeah. actors do, because that's a different type of... Um, well, mm, ah, now, yeah. there's a thing about that. Um, but yes, actually, our, our students have a very high uh, employment rate. Uh, and strangely enough, um, in doing things that they've been trained to do, so do actors. Uh, at least in the short-ish term. Um, this, this idea that the acting profession, uh, that acting graduates, you know, finish up working in fish shops is, is a little bit out of date. There is so much going on now that requires actors and it may, might, a lot of it happens on screen. Uh, not necessarily broadcast screens, but in other screens. Well, of course, one thing that's come up recently is that um, Amazon has announced it's going into film production mm -hmm. and... Um, with a much shorter lead time to get uh, films to uh, the wider public. They say that um, Amazon original movies will premiere on Prime Instant Video in the US just four to eight weeks after their theatrical debut instead of normal film for 30 to 50 weeks. So um, this is really interesting that they actually expect to, to make possibly 70 productions a year. So that's a really big deal in terms of um, getting new things on screen and maybe bringing on people who could turn into an, another, well, not a, there'd never be another Stanley Kubrick, but another great director. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, so do you think you can actually um, teach people to be artistic as, uh, when they're shooting in film or you know, not? You or can suggest teach, it to them? You can teach people to be self-critical. Yes. And not, not be so, yeah, so easily pleased with what they are mm. doing. I mean, you have to teach people that it is very easy to make a film, but very <laughs> difficult to make a good film that other people want to see. Mm. And a great film is almost a miracle. Like any great painting, any great symphony, uh, any great novel, you know, this is, doesn't happen on a daily basis. So, yeah, I, I, I like that very much. I mean, I started with Kubrick in 1969 on Napoleon. I thought I'd come to England for one year and then go to Romania, and then I'd go back to my previous job, which had to do with planning. And uh, it turned out differently. But I instantly loved this, yeah, you could call it obsessive, but this love for detail. And why was he so interested in Napoleon? Everything is known about this man. There's nothing new you could tell anybody about Napoleon. About 5,000 books have been written about this guy. What interested him was the relevance of this man for us today. Mm. A brilliantly talented and successful man who didn't have what it takes to be a statesman. A statesman he was not. Mm. He was, had only himself to blame for his downfall. And then, okay, I mean, all right, that was the overall picture. Now he went into the details. What was it in the details? Well, on the ill-conceived Russian campaign of 1812, he used the wrong nails to shoe the horses. And he was warned, and he brushed it off. The French horses were shooed by metal, with metal nails. That's no good for sub-zero temperatures in Russia. The horses lose, the nail drops out because it retracts. The horses uh, lose their shoes and then they become lame and then they're unable to pull these cannons and wagons through the snow. Um, yeah, 25,000 horses died on the way back from Moscow. La Grande Armée of 550,000 lost 500,000 men, mainly through frost and hunger, not because of the Cossacks. So, you know, and you could pin this, pin this almost down a little bit to, to, to the wrong nail. <laughs> so it's a tiny bit, now obviously that's too oversimplifying the issue, but it is one element which impressed me of how Kubrick did research. Mm -hmm. 
and that's how he worked, and I loved it. Okay. The film, unfortunately, was never made. Okay. He, he worked for two years. We wanted to go to Romania. We had a deal with the Ceausescu regime for the Romanian cavalry. There was no computer graphics at that time. You had to do the real thing. <laughs> yeah. And you can't use horses and riders. They don't look like a cavalry. You need a cavalry with the officers and everything. And, uh, but then there was another production by Dino De Laurentiis in the uh, pipeline, uh, Waterloo with Rod Steiger, and MGM got cold feet and pulled out, and there we are. I, in the meantime, with my wife and baby, had moved to England, and um, I liked him, he liked me, he asked me to uh, I would stay with him, and, and I had fun, and one of the first things we did is buy the rights to Traumnovelle by Arthur Schnitzler in 1970. We had a deal with Warner Brothers. Everything was ready to go and Stanley pulled out. And that project became Eyes Wide Shut 30 years later. For that, it took him that long to chew over this most difficult film in his life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were going no, to no, say no, something. I'm, I'm Sorry, just, I was I'm just hanging to... on, hanging on Jan's every word. <laughs> I was going to ask you um, about the Wolf Hall candlelight oh, yes, yes. thing, and um, the, the thing is, you said that, um, that in fact it was very heavily influenced by the theatre production. Well, I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I do know that Looks the similar. the uh, the theatre version of it, the RSC's version of it, uh, both at Stratford and then that came to London. Uh, late last year, was, was lit with a very similar sort of style, not with candles, but, but in that sort of faces and bodies barely, faces in the gloom and emerging out of gloom and bodies <coughs> barely lit. And we were talking before about the, the sort of symbiosis between um, screen image and uh, theatre image in that a, a lot of my colleagues who are professional lighting designers began to feel more empowered about being more high contrast and being more, if you like, obvious with lighting um, post CSI and the digital camera revolution uh, and the ways in which DOPs, particularly on the, starting with the HBO series as, uh, from the States, but also that then came into British TV as well, uh, were also more bold and, and direct with light. Um, allowing light to tell a story. There, there is still this thing within British theatre that uh, the best lighting design is lighting design you don't notice. And I get really cross about that. Because, okay, sometimes in some situations, yeah, you don't need to notice the lighting design. But, but in some ways, if you, if you read through a play like Macbeth, it's all about... Well, no, the metaphor that is used throughout that is the fading of the light, the, the, the descent into nighttime, and then the dawn coming through, uh, through the, the, the moving trees of the forest. Uh, and if you don't engage with that as a lighting designer and help to tell that story as well, then you're not doing your job. And, and I think that uh, the boldness of a lot of television DOPs uh, has... Uh, made it more normal for us to see that kind of image on stage as well, um, which, is, which is great. Well, certainly the, um, the, the controversy over it, you know, kind of, we can't see a thing, no. and then now, kind of, but it's sort of changed over the last few days into, actually, it's brilliant. So, you know, there are a lot of people who think it's a fantastic um, production, and, and I wonder if that will mean that quite a lot of people have, who missed it will have downloaded the first episode and catch mm. up on the well, second. Because so. it had I quite a big audience for mm. BBC Two of four million. Yes. It might even go up. Mm. Well, it's got brilliant actors in as well. And it's based on a brilliant story, a, a brilliant book. Um, that's but been you very see, well one of the things that came up last year at this conference was that um, there, you, you naturally, of course, in theatre and, and in film, you're going to know about art in terms of theatre and plays you know you're, you're going yeah. to that's part of the the course but with um tv um there is an, an argument by by some people that there should be more artistic input mm. into e production courses as well as um, general sort of other courses so that people actually have an appreciation of art and what has already been done rather than having to reinvent the wheel <laughs> i i tend to agree with that yes yes i mean certainly we we at, at Central, we run craft courses, management courses, and the design courses across most fields, 
that are involved here. A lot of our craft students come up here and do um, placements uh, in the paint shops and construction shops and things. And, and one of the key things for them is not just to know, as somebody else was pointing out earlier, it's not just to know how to put the paint on the canvas in that particular way. It's why you're putting the paint on the canvas in that particular way as well. Because that means that you can work, eventually you can work without instruction. It does, as long as you only know how to do it, you need to be told what to do. Mm. As soon as you understand why you're doing that, then you can move into independent create, creation. Okay, two, that's... Two, sorry, example, did you want two examples yeah. about okay. bringing the art into it. You asked me whether mm -hmm. it can be taught. Okay, two totally different examples in my experience. Take again this film, Eyes Wide Shut. The ballroom scene. Uh, it was all shot, uh, lighting it with a Christmas decoration. Mm -hmm. yeah, Christmas came to our help because we had the camera on a steady cam. There was nobody in the room other than the crowd to be filmed. So the, the operator had 360 degrees freedom. Everybody else was outside. You shoot it at F2 with, with uh, very little depth of field. And if you went into this room before they shot, oh, goodness me, did it look ugly. You know, with these big uh, stars which you have outside a department store, 100 watt bulbs in it, and it did not, nothing. But if it's totally out of focus, and if you have artificial fog in the room, suddenly it's beautiful. So that, that's what I mean by bringing the art into a very technical, down-to-earth affair, namely filming something that looks really special. Mm. The other thing is, take music. When 2001 was made, and Stanley had already a score, and then didn't really love it, that, that's the key, and I'm using that word deliberately, he had to be in love with the music. Liking it this, this doesn't come into it. It's much too weak. So he loved waltzes. He used the Blue Danube for space music. Hmm. Does it fit? Yes, it does fit if you really love it. And the question of, well, it doesn't make any sense, is irrelevant. It's like saying Chagall's donkeys don't fly. Well, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So that, that's, that's what I mean by, by bringing... That's just two little examples of how an artistic element comes into a very down-to-earth, practical uh, execution of a job. Mm -hmm. yeah? I, mean, I mean, film manufacturing, film making is basically a, a manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. The art has to be brought in by an artist. And you could say, no artist, no art. Mm. And you could also say, no love, no quality. <laughs> yeah. um, questions? Um, yes? Just that gentleman there. Uh, my name is Brian Rose. Not from the Guild of Television Cameraman this time, but as a victim of Full Metal Jacket. And as one of the five focus pullers, Stanley managed to fire. But that doesn't really matter. Um, I, I'm so pleased that both of you are here today because I actually think that, and it's to Jan and to Nick and perhaps some of the people in this audience, are we actually underestimating ourselves in the television industry? Because we're talking about what we can learn from film, what we can learn from theatre. Um, over the last four or five years, the technology has changed. We no longer, for film, use 35 millimeter. It's all digital. We're actually all using the same equipment. We're also forgetting that television screens are getting bigger and bigger. Those of us who worked in television a long time ago were used to some one or two people here, nine inch screens, well, certainly when I was a kid. Um, we've now got 4K television starting. So should we actually be setting the pole, if you like, higher up? But isn't that in a sense with, with Amazon doing these films, which they're doing for film and TV? So it's a complete, yes. it's a complete yeah, that, that's both, thing. I, I, I just think sometimes we're not actually giving ourselves the space to the kind of excellence uh, that certainly my experience of working with Stanley was, you know, because he didn't take prisoners. It just had to be a thousand percent, not a hundred percent. I have to say, 
one of the reasons that I didn't maintain my career in, um, in TV was to do with finding it increasingly difficult to find other people who cared enough about the image to make it worth my while turning up to work. And, and I was very lucky because at the time I, was also, I also had opportunities in a large opera house where the wages were more or less the same. TV still paid more, but frankly, you know, I didn't need to go to work to, to, to make rubbish images when I could go to work and make really good images that I was proud of. And that is a shame. No, there, there, were not in, there was not enough care being paid to the final image. Another question? Gentleman at the front here. Um, my question Hang on, just wait for the mic. And can you say who you are? Uh, my name is Nosa Obayuana. I am the course leader for film and media at Gloucester College. Uh, my question is about uh, the statement you made about time and self-criticism. And in a sense, uh, quite a number of students come to us with this uh, philosophy that they gain kind of like in secondary school where they're not used to being interrogated about the work, mm. about how they made this work, why is this work not good, and you know, building in that self-criticism. And the question I want to ask is, how have you, in teaching younger students, started to, how have you been able to build that idea of being intensely self-critical about the work you create with, with younger people? Because it is difficult with younger people. You know, older people can take it. But with younger people, you don't want to hurt their, their passion for, the, for creativity, but you also want to deal, you know, embed that uh, self-critical uh, attitude into it. And also the idea of time, you know, because we live in a fast food world where there's, everything is done quickly and to, to make them understand that you can take time. And to also, from our point of view as teachers, because you say, well, I want this assignment done, you know, in five weeks. Maybe that uh, idea can't be done in five weeks. Maybe he needs eight weeks to do it. And you know, my question is, how do we kind of build this? And I would like to ask other teachers here as well, or other lecturers, how do we build this into the ethos of, of what we do? So, uh, you want me to answer mm. that? Mm. Well, I, I would definitely say to a young student, make it clear, and it's a bit abstract, that a good film is being made with pen, paper, heart, and brain yes. initially. That's what you need, that you have to first have an idea. Um, um, let me again uh, uh, quote Stanley Kubrick. He, he once was asked by a journalist, what did make you, to, what, why did you choose this particular book? I'm interested. And he said, I, so I'm, I, don't, I can't, I, you may as well ask me why I married my wife. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, 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 he, 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 make, he makes a shortcut. It's a point. You have to be in love with an idea. And once you are in love with an idea or with a story or with anything, then you have a chance of developing it. Maybe it doesn't work, you fall out of love and you find the, fall in love with something else. But that, that is necessary and there you have to be totally reckless. And great artists always were yeah, totally determined with, with following an idea and they may have been ridiculed. I mean, you know, Van Gogh had a little exhibition in Paris and a very important film critic, uh, art critic, suggested he should first learn how to paint mm -hmm. before uh, offering his wares to the public. You know? And when Beethoven's Seventh Symphony was first performed in, in Vienna, which has a big crescendo at the end, uh, a very important and well-meaning and very clever and very sophisticated and intelligent music critic wrote that his greatest achievement was clearly to make the music more available to those hard of hearing. <laughs> so, I mean, what I'm saying is, to answer your question, pen, paper, heart, and mind, and then you have to go with it. You have, if, you, if you say, oh, well, maybe a nice idea, don't do it. There has to be passion. Maybe a nice idea, don't do it. That, that's really good <laughs> advice. I think it's a really, it's a really important question. Um, and uh, one of the things is um, don't base the assessment on the outcome. Base the assessment on the, the route to the outcome. Mm -hmm. So that they have the right to mess up the outcome if their route to it is a good and fruitful route that in the future will provide them with something. 
If you make it so that everything they produce has to be perfect, nothing will be very good. They won't, be, they won't reach out and try and achieve that very good. Uh, mm. Yeah. Okay. I, I do, uh, for example, yeah. I have yeah. a, 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 one of my programs is a short film as a calling card. Now, I see th hundreds and hundreds of short films, and most of them are really boring, and, and some are incredible. And there is, I discovered one short film many years ago, fantastic. And this woman who made it made a big film based on that film. Now she made another film which has been nominated for the Oscars. That's great, but that's talent, and it is a mixture of, of talent and passion and love and being careful and self-critical that brings you success. Okay, one more question. Any more? There's a gentleman there in the back. Oh, yes. Right. Hi, David Love, Tunbridge School. So I'm much lower than a lot of you guys here, but um, I just wanted to know your opinions of, of uh, like the NT Live that's becoming more and more popular and the co are there compromises in, in therefore in lighting design for the theatrical performance to make it visible for a TV audience? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and it, you know that's based on the basic physics that our eyes can cope with a bigger contrast ratio than any digital camera can at the moment. Um, and also, you, you have to acknowledge that NT Live is something quite different from a live performance. You're not in the same room as the performance, and it's fundamentally different. Um, I think at its best, NT Live and its various other offshoots have produced and uh, have gone beyond documentation. I think in the past, all we've really been able to do is a vague kind of document of a particular performance and they haven't really lived, they haven't really been, they haven't had the same sort of power, and you know, if you don't know the, the, the actors involved, it, it's kind of dull. And I think this generation of, of NT Live stuff has, has thought about it more. I think the directors have, got, have done more research, they know why they're shooting from this particular angle, why this shot, not that shot, at this particular moment. From what I gather from colleagues, they collaborate as the, their teams collaborate much more with the theatre teams. And I think we're getting close to something which is genuine, uh, the best you can do in putting live performance on screen. But it's still not live performance. And that's fine. Well, of course, with the, the old fashioned way of, of shooting Shakespeare films in black and white that yes. long ago, um, they were all fairly flat and boomy and kind of, well, you know, not. Yeah, you had 10Ks all around the circle front and uh, as much light as you could possibly and get on stage. Sort of say yeah. It's very stagey. Yeah, yeah. So it's getting across that, isn't it? It's yes. di because they are so different, the theatre and <coughs> TV in that sense. Indeed. And I think that there's the. the there, is less difference now between the stage acting technique and a, and a screen acting technique as well. Uh, d at times, to the detriment of both, in, in fact. Um, I mean, it's interesting, Mark Rylance, who I think is one of the most brilliant actors of his generation, can do both with consummate ease. Well, he's doing little facial gestures yes. in Wolf Hall, and, yeah. and, yeah, Which, well, and, and he's much bigger on stage. Absolutely, uh, and so you know, in, in the globe where you're completely exposed. Mm. He's, he, he rivets you to the back of your seat, just as he does on the small screen, so mm. in a different way. Last point? No, no fine. Fine? No, no, fine. Yeah. Okay, because we're going to finish, so do you want a last point no. to make? No, no fine, no. fine. <laughs> That's it then. I just agreed with what he said, <laughs> and I liked the sort of all I saw the yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you very much indeed to Nick and Jan. Thank you. Well done. Are you happy? Very happy. Very good. Thank you. Um, we've got a break for tea now, so please be back by 15:30, uh, and we'll be having uh, talking to some students about what they think of the course.